uh, political reviews, which don't happen anymore. Um, he, was a, he was just a great leader in our community. We're grateful that, um, that uh, the family's with us today. Thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for these contributions so that we can, uh, we can continue to focus on civil liberties. Um, those of you interested in smart people, by the way, Nadine Strassen happened to graduate Harvard Phi Beta Kappa, um, and we've got the Phi Beta Kappa secretary, Fred Lawrence, coming uh, March 27th. Yeah, a friend, a friend of Nadine's. And by the way, I was looking at the blurbs on the back here. Two of, the bl two of these people have spoken at the City Club within the last three years. Very interesting. Um, so that's all I've got for now. Um, the membership thing that, uh, that uh, Ben said about ACLU, I totally endorse that. If you want to get two memberships today, consider the City Club. I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, but, um, but also, there's a ton of great stuff coming, uh, coming up, including our State of the County on April 18th. Um, which is going to be hel held at the convention center, um, and uh, a ton of other great things. Check it all out, cityclub.org. We're going to start in a couple of minutes. If there's anyone at your table you haven't yet introduced yourself to, fix that. Thank you. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Robin Minter Smyers and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the former president of the American Civil Liberties Union and author of Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship, Nadine Strassen. On college campuses, workplaces, social media and neighborhoods across the country, debates are raging about hate speech and free speech. People want answers to questions like, is hate speech protected? And if so, where? Is there a distinction between free speech and hate speech? What should be done to combat hate speech? Thankfully, we have a speaker here today with important perspectives to share on those questions. Nadine Strassen writes, teaches, and advocates in the areas of constitutional law, 
civil liberties, and international human rights. A native of Hopkins, Minnesota, and a daughter of a Holocaust survivor, Ms. Strassen served as the first female president of the American Civil Liberties Union from 1991 to 2008. During her tenure at the ACLU, the organization re-examined its position on hate speech and concluded that censoring such speech would do more harm than good, a position Ms. Strassen explores in her new book, Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard College and magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where she was the editor of the Harvard Law Review. Twice named as one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America by the National Law Journal, Ms. Strassen is now the John Marshall Harlan Professor of Law at New York Law School. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Nadine Strassen. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Robin, and thank everybody else for the warm welcome. Uh, Robin, if I may be so immodest, I want to brag about one of my accomplishments that I'm most proud of that you didn't mention, that I had the great honor of speaking here. <laughs> it, way <laughs> And thanks to, I did remember it, but my records aren't nearly as good as yours. And Dan, in a flash, did the research and discovered that I first had the pleasure of and honor of speaking here way back in 1991, uh, just two months after I had become ACLU president. So one of my, uh, still to this day, one of my most important. And I look forward to the next opportunity as well. So uh, as, as Dan indicated in his introductory remarks, this is such a hospitable forum, not only for a civil libertarian, but in particular for a civil libertarian who is talking about the themes in my book because you share exactly the same values that are at the heart of both the ACLU's mission and my mission in writing the book, which is uh, not only to support freedom of speech, important as that is, but also to advance equality of access and opportunity for everybody in the community. And those two values, I deeply believe, are mutually reinforcing. I was very struck when I read, again, your mission statement and your vision, uh, both of which are so powerful. Also, when I read the creed of your organization, I'm sure you all know it by heart, uh, but bear with me as I remind you of just a few highlights which really celebrate the integral interrelationship of liberty and justice for all, individual and community uh, being mutually reinforcing. So, and this goes back to, as you all know, to uh, 1916, uh, really foresightful and yet uh, timeless. So, uh, quoting the City Club, I hail and harbor and hear persons of every belief and party. Within my portals, prejudice grows less and bias dwindles. I am the product of the people, a cross section of their community, weak and strong, a house of fellowship. So I could not have said it better. I will just quote one other um, eloquent source whom I quote 12 months a year, but it's especially important now during February Black History Month Martin Luther King with his constant eloquence and advocacy against hatred, but not through censorship, through more speech, which he demonstrated every day of his much too short life. And this is uh, one of his many statements that I'm sure is very familiar to all of you, but I think cannot be repeated too often, which is darkness cannot drive out darkness only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. 
And speaking of Dr. King, um, of course, made me, uh, the occasion of speaking here gave me the impetus to look again at Robert Kennedy's historic and absolutely mesmerizing, spellbinding talk here the day after King's assassination, mindless menace of violence. And it could not be more timely. I don't understand why it's not as well known as some of his other speeches. The research I did uh, made me realize that I wasn't the only one who didn't know it as well as some of his other words. Uh, but those words, along with King's, really stand the test of time. And thank you for having provided a forum for such an important message. Well, my book uh, can be boiled down to four interrelated <coughs> themes, which I'm going to exercise my discipline to lay out very briefly at the beginning of my remarks, because I'm respectful of time and really looking forward to the opportunity to hear your questions. So I'll lay them out very briefly, and then time permitting, I will elaborate on uh, them as much as time will permit. So number one, as I already indicated, we do not have to choose between liberty and equality, between resisting hatred and resisting censorship. Rather, contrary to certain allegations that are made that these goals are in tension with each other, I am more convinced than ever, based on the deep research I did for my book, as well as my longstanding personal experience, that these goals are mutually reinforcing and indivisible. That's point number one. Uh, point number two is that Censorship of hate speech, no matter how well intended that goal is, or the goals are, and, and let me just put a, a pause here to add a parenthesis, the goals that are uh, supposed to be, hoped to be furthered by censoring hate, hate speech, by those who advocate censorship, I completely share their goals. So I, I cannot emphasize that strongly enough. I could not be more committed to equality and dignity, diversity, inclusivity, societal harmony, individual mental well-being, uh, physiological, psychological, emotional. So well intended as censorship advocates are that those goals are actually not advanced by censorship. To the contrary, um, censorship of hate speech is ineffective at best in advancing those goals and counterproductive at worst. Uh, the single most counterproductive, dramatic counterproductive impact of hate speech laws is that disproportionately they are consistently enforced precisely against the very dissenting and reforming and minority voices and viewpoints that they are hoped to empower. That has been a consistent pattern around the world to this day. It was true in the United States. It still is true to the extent that we still do have occasional examples of anti-hate speech laws. And that is one of the reasons why Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement and all of the civil rights organizations in our country's history have opposed censoring hate speech because their speech was disproportionately silenced by every law that could be used to silence and to stifle. That's why MLK wrote his historic letter from a Birmingham jail. Point number three is that non-sensorial measures, including counter speech, raising our voices to counter the hateful messages and the potential hateful impact of hate speech, counter speech is more effective than censorship. So for all of these reasons, the, the first three um, points that I've made so far, all of those are enough to justify opposing censorship of hate speech. And for that reason, um, not only civil rights organizations in this country, but also 
human rights activists around the world have spoken out and advocated strongly against hate speech laws. This was actually one of the new facts that I learned as a result of doing research for my book. I was quite pleasantly surprised at the number of human rights lawyers and other human rights experts and advocates in countries all over the world which do have anti-hate speech laws who have concluded that those laws do not work and are doing more harm than good and are advocating that their countries should move more in the direction of the United States, not because of any concern about First Amendment law. They don't have the First Amendment in their countries. To the contrary, their legal systems permit and in some cases even require censorship of hate speech, but precisely from the perspective of what is going to be the most effective way to advance the underlying goals. Um, my fourth point is, as you can now understand, an independent argument for um, opposing censorship, and that is First Amendment principles, which actually enshrine uh, universal concepts of free speech that I believe should be uh, uh, followed, even when not legally required, in uh, areas such as the private sector in this country, which is not directly bound by the First Amendment, but I think private sector uh, universities and social media companies, to mention a very important example, should choose to adhere to the same free speech principles that are mandated by First Amendment law. And having taught and advocated about First Amendment principles for many years, I still gained a deepened appreciation of those principles as a result of the deep thinking I had to do to write the book. And I came out with a much heightened understanding and appreciation. I think if people really understood these principles, they would be much more supportive because the principles are a very commonsensical. The government may, may censor speech when speech poses the greatest danger, but government may not censor speech when censorship poses the greatest danger. Uh, so those are my four overlapping main points. Uh, the bottom line for all of us is that we have a moral responsibility to raise our voices to counter hatred and discrimination and stereotyping wherever we see it and hear it. I have uh, three epigrams to my book, one of which is from Dr. King, one of which is from Barack Obama, and they are all on this theme. I'll read Barack Obama's, um, and it, this was a point that he made uh, very regularly when he was president, including on college campuses, including addressing historically black colleges and universities and minority students. He said, the strongest weapon against hateful speech is not repression, it is more speech, the voices of tolerance that rally against bigotry and lift up mutual respect. So that's the overview. I still have a little bit of time, so I'm gonna begin to amplify, and I'll amplify putting on my constitutional law professor hat uh, by saying a bit more about the First Amendment principles. But um, actually, just one introductory point before I launch into the legal, I'll be uh, exactly the, at the opposite end of the spectrum here and be very personal. Uh, Robin did mention in her generous introduction that I am the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. So I want you to know that I approach these issues uh, not only from a perspective of, um, of empathy for anybody who is subject to hatred and discrimination and stereotyping of any sort, but I, I have a deep, deep, direct personal stake in this. My father was born in Berlin um, in 1922 and I'm very proud that as a teenager he was very active politically in the anti-Hitler movement. Uh, for that reason and because his mother was Jewish, what the vicious Nuremberg racist laws uh, categorized him as a Jew of the second degree because one of his parents was of Jewish ancestry. For those two reasons, he was put into the Buchenwald concentration camp. 
And at the time he went in, he was young enough and healthy enough that they did not immediately slate him for murder. Uh, he was condemned to do slave labor. So it's very you know, striking that uh, you're seeing here the daughter of somebody who was enslaved doing backbreaking, soul-crushing labor that uh, did almost lead to death. Many people in that forced labor camp were dying um, like flies because of the horrific uh, health and, and you know, nutrition conditions. And just one final point, uh, as an undesirable, he was slated to be sterilized by the Nazis. And literally one day before he was scheduled to be sterilized, he was liberated by the American military. So <laughs> I love speaking to military audiences. I know they also take an oath and affirmation to uphold our Constitution. I know we're all fighting for those same pr principles and freedoms in our, our different way. But I absolutely could not hold more loathing for Nazis. And um, if I thought uh, that censorship might have been a way to stop the Nazis from rising to power in Germany or fascism from uh, racism reemerging here. I would probably have a different view, but I'm absolutely convinced that, uh, and I know from the history of Nazi Germany, uh, which did censor, had very strong hate speech laws. Many people are not aware of that. Uh, very similar to the strict anti-hate speech laws that Germany is enforcing to this day. And the leading Jewish organization at the time said that the law was being fairly enforced. There were a lot of prosecutions and convictions, including of Nazi leaders, and guess what? They loved it for the same reason that today's white supremacists, and believe me, I'm not trying to say they're equivalent, they're not engaging in genocide, but they have the same strategic approach, which is they love it when we attempt to censor them, uh, when we cause disruption. It may feel very morally satisfying, but it ends up giving them the platform that they would not otherwise have. It gives them sympathy that they would not otherwise have. Um, so we have to resist those temptations. Now, now to the First Amendment, now that you understand my personal as well as professorial uh, stake in these principles. There are so many misunderstandings. I was, uh, whenever I speak somewhere, I look at what's been going on in your community, and of course I saw there have been, as there have been everywhere, some campus controversies. And of course there was a, you know, just horrific example of uh, anti-gay hate speech at Cleveland State University about a year and a half ago. Uh, the president of the university uh, broke out, uh, condemned the expression, uh, but explained that these posters, that you know, vicious anti-gay posters, could not be censored consistent with free speech. And that led a student to, students to organize a program, uh, a demonstration called Let President Berkman Know, colon, hate speech isn't free speech. And we hear that all the time, but in fact, that generalization is not correct. The Supreme Court never has created a category of hate speech defined by its hateful or hated content and said it is not protected by the First Amendment because of that content. However, it is also not true, something that is often said by others uh, who should know better, that hate speech is free speech, that that generalization also is untrue. Hate speech can and should be punished in particular contexts. And that's why I say our law, if we understand it, is more nuanced and more commonsensical than most people understand uh, or misunderstand through those two opposite but equally incorrect generalizations. So on that first generalization that uh, the Supreme Court never has created a category of hate speech defined by hateful messages and said because of its content, uh, it is constitutionally unprotected. To the contrary, the Supreme Court repeatedly has said that the bedrock principle underlying our free speech jurisprudence is content neutrality or viewpoint neutrality that government may never discriminate against speech, punish it, regulate it, 
because of even loathing by the vast majority of us of its content or its ideas. Rather, we have to oppose those with counter speech. And this principle is so widely accepted that, let me give you an example, the last time the Supreme Court dealt with a hate speech law was just a year and a half ago, the summer of 2017. The court unanimously rejected a struck down a federal hate speech law. Now think about that. We know how deeply divided this Supreme Court is, including on many First Amendment issues, so that all of them, from the and they're ideologically, you know, extreme conservatives and extreme progressives, that they all agreed on this principle. And it was in a case that shows the mutually reinforcing nature of equality concerns, empowerment concerns for those who have traditionally been marginalized and excluded, and robust freedom of speech, even for hate speech. So let me tell you a little bit about that case. It was called Mattel versus Tam, and it involved a um, federal statute in our patent and trademark laws that prohibited trademarking a name, getting a trade name recognition for a term that the government officials considered to be disparaging on the basis of race, ethnicity, and so forth. And that's a classic way of phrasing an anti-hate speech law. Well, guess what? The individuals who wanted to use this disparaging ethnic term in this case were not hate mongers who were seeking to undermine the equal rights of the ethnic group in question, namely Asian Americans. To the contrary, the individuals who wanted to use that term were themselves Asian Americans. And specifically, uh, the term was the slants, and it was chosen by a young Asian American rock musician named Simon Tam and his bandmates, who were also Asian American rock musicians, because they wanted to assert and celebrate their pride in their ethnic heritage. They wanted to overcome negative stereotypes. They are a band that I've had the privilege of meeting and listening to and dancing to. Uh, and uh, they crusade. They go to prisons. They go to all kinds of venues to uh, preach messages of human rights. So when the Supreme Court held that the government could not deny them their individual freedom of choice to speak and express their anti-racist message through a term that could uh, be used for opposite purposes, you understand the Supreme Court was in one fell swoop protecting not only their liberty but also their <coughs> dignity and their equality. Now, the other uh, major free speech principle that does allow for hate speech in certain contexts to be punished is often called the emergency principle. Just as content alone can never be enough to unprotect speech, in a particular context, a hateful message along with any other message can and should be censored, punished, regulated, and that is when in a particular context that speech directly causes certain serious, imminent, specific harm. And there's no other way of preventing the harm other than silencing the speaker. Uh, sadly, there are many instances of hateful speech that does satisfy that standard. And I can give you two counterexamples from Charlottesville, uh, that awful scenario back in August of 2017, when the white supremacists were seeking to parade with their obnoxious, vile, um, racist messages. The ACLU, I am proud, was absolutely correct. The federal judge was absolutely correct in saying no matter how much we hate that message, that is not a justification for censoring. It's why we're going to be out there counter demonstrating and doing whatever we can to counter their messages through other actions, including, you know, working for anti discrimination laws and um, empowerment through vote, you know, countering voter suppression and all of the positive pro civil rights agenda. However, when and uh, nobody expected this in advance. The context changes, so suddenly they are speaking en masse with brandishing lighted torches and firearms. That crosses the line. That 
uh, is one type of speech that satisfies this emergency principle. The courts have called it a true threat uh, to distinguish from the way we tend to loosely use the word threat in everyday speech. I feel threatened by the fact that Milo Yiannopoulos is going to be speaking on my campus. That does not justify censorship. But a true threat, which is punishable, is when the speaker is addressing a specific audience and means to instill in a reasonable member of the audience a fear, a reasonable fear of being subject to some kind of violence. And, uh, believe, and the speaker does not have to intend to actually carry out the threat because you're already deprived of your freedom, right? If you are reasonably feeling fear, I would have felt intimidated from exercising my free speech rights of counter protest in that situation. Uh, so I think our law has it exactly right. Now, with the eye on the clock, um, let me uh, go on to amplify just a little bit more uh, on some of the uh, pragmatic overlapping, uh, pragmatic and strategic concerns that overlap with First Amendment principles. And that has to do with the kinds of harm uh, that can be caused by hate speech. I oppose censorship, not at all because I deny the potential harmful power of hateful speech. To the contrary, I agree with the Supreme Court when it said, uh, we protect free speech precisely because we know and respect how powerful it is. Power to do great harm and power to do great good. But the reason why I keep saying potential harm is, and it goes back to that old nursery rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We know descriptively that is not true. All of us have been hurt by words. I've been subject to anti-Semitic and misogynistic hate speech, but you know your heart can be broken, your pride can be wounded, go on and on. We've all been hurt by words. But what you think of, when I think of when my mother told me that nursery rhyme, and I'm sure it's uh, similar to the rest of you, it was a normative statement. It was exhorting us, do not let the words hurt you, right? You can control that because it, words have the power to do either good or harm only through the intermediating thought processes of the human mind. And all of us, I have learned through uh, psychological mental health experts, all of us can learn resilience to not allow ourselves to be disparaged. And I say this not at all saying we should blame the victim, but the opposite, that we don't have to become victims. We should look down on those who are trying to reduce our status rather than the opposite. And I thought it was actually quite ironic that one of the organizers of that march of the demonstration that I mentioned, uh, Let President Berkman Know Hate Speech Isn't Free Speech, in the same article that described that protest, it quotes organizer Molly Statnick, who said, CSU students and the community will not be intimidated by these posters. And I wrote, yes, in all caps and exclamation marks. We can learn how not to let them um, have that kind of harmful impact. And that was in addition to psychologists talking about how all of us can learn um, and to withstand the potential slings and arrows of words, political activists, especially minority group leaders, have been making that point over and over again. I've already quoted Obama. Uh, another example is Van Jones, who is speaking, uh, he was speaking actually at the University of Chicago, and he said, I don't want you to be safe ideologically, I want you to be strong. I want you to be deeply aggrieved and offended and upset and then to learn how to speak back because that is what we need from you. Um, I'll read one other quote and then I'll conclude. The quote is from another one of my heroes, Ruth Simmons, who was uh, back in the early 90s, became the first African American president of any Ivy League University and she was the first female president of Brown University. In her first convocation address, she said, you know something that I hate? When people say, that doesn't make me feel good about myself. I say, that's not what you're here for. I believe that learning at its best is the antithesis 
of comfort. If you come to this campus for comfort, I would urge you to walk through yon iron gate. But if you seek betterment for yourself, for your community and posterity, stay and fight. So um, concluding thought, I have to go back to my full circle to my opening remarks about the enormous power of counter speech and the responsibility of those of us who champion the goals that motivate some people to advocate censorship, uh, that we have a special responsibility to exercise our free speech rights, not only against censorship, but against hatred and inequality. And again, um, uh, Dr. King is one of the epigrams in my book uh, who said this so well when he said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So thank you, friends, for not remaining silent. Today, we're listening to a forum with Nadine Strassen, the former president of the American Civil Liberties Union and author of Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via the radio broadcast or live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding the microphones today are content coordinator Bliss Davis and marketing and outreach coordinator Julie Wong. May we have the first question, please? Thank you for coming back to Cleveland. Earlier this week, Roger Stone posted an Instagram of uh, Judge Jackson in crosshairs. Uh, Judge Jackson, I think it was yesterday or the day before, uh, puts a gag order on him and she says, in the world of social media, there is no such thing as a take back. Could you talk to us about how you think uh, social media has changed the fundamental bedrock of the First Amendment uh, and free speech? Thank you so much for that excellent question. And now all of you who were paying attention to teacher's lesson know that that communication could be punished as a true threat, right? I think it intended to and did instill a reasonable fear of being attacked. So social, this is a huge and incredibly important subject. The Supreme Court in 2017, again, unanimously pronounced that social media constitute the most important platform of all for the exchange of information and ideas, not only among us, our family, friends, neighbors, and so forth, but also with government officials and about government officials and politicians. So if we don't have robust free speech there, for all practical purposes, we might not have it anywhere. Now, uh, there are many challenges. I think the challenge that has gotten the most attention, and I put this in that category, um, is we get so much publicity about the negative content, right? The threatening messages, the hateful messages, the extremist messages. Uh, but it's also really important to note that just as social media along with all media can do great harm, it also can do great good. So just as it's easier to disseminate hate speech, to go back to my topic, it is also much easier to disseminate counter speech. And there have been very heartening initiatives that are not nearly as well known as they should be. And to their credit, the social media company are among the funders and initiators of these studies, but foundations and universities and scholars are also participating in how can we A, study hate speech and B, counteract it and C, study what counter speech techniques are the most effective because you have the ability to study that. And there, it's a very new field, but the uh, results are very encouraging. And I think it is, you know, along with all media, can be harnessed to, to counter hatred and stereotyping. Now, how are we going to get to that point? 
That is a really difficult question because, as I indicated in my opening remarks, uh, the social media are private sector entities, so they are not constrained by the First Amendment. They have complete, in fact, they are exercising their own First Amendment rights as they decided they don't like you or they don't like your ideas. And sorry, you're excommunicated from this forum that the Supreme Court has said correctly is the most important forum, not only for individual liberty, but for exercising our participation as members of a democratic society. Uh, so it's kind of the worst of both worlds. They have all the power of a government, in fact, magnified many, many, many times over. Uh, and yet they do not have the constitutional constraints that the government has. This has become a very, very serious concern in the last two years as people are aware of abuses in every direction, speech that should not be there, that is including threats and other uh, punishable speech and speech that, that should be there and is not. So for example, the ACLU is part of a coalition of 77 civil rights and civil liberties organizations that have been complaining to Facebook and Twitter that they are disproportionately, guess what, enforcing their hate speech rules against Black Lives Matter protesters and pipeline protesters and anybody who is challenging the status quo. Um, some activists actually use the term race book uh, to describe Facebook. So we have these, these two very serious problems and many others. And uh, again, uh, government officials as well as scholars are working very, very hard for potential solutions. And uh, so far, it, what seems to me to be a promising approach is an antitrust, anti or pro-competition approach that uh, as these companies are approaching monopoly or duopoly power over the economic marketplace, we have to put in place some regulations that will not allow them to leverage that power uh, to completely um, dominate the marketplace of ideas as well. Thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, recently, the Senate passed Senate uh, Bill 1, sponsored by Senator Rubio and, and I think others. Um, if someone wished to institute a boycott of Saudi Arabia because of its oppression of women and its abysmal record on uh, uh, human rights, under the terms of Senator Rubio's bill, should it become law, uh, is the right to boycott Saudi Arabia still a protected right? So this is a reference to um, a, an anti-BDS legislation, right, for boycott, divest, and sanction. And the DT that we have a number of these bills that have already been passed at, in a couple of states, uh, and, and this one is pending in Congress. The details of each one may differ somewhat, but uh, the ones that have been enacted so far, and to the best of my knowledge, this one, have been opposed by the ACLU and other civil liberties organizations on the ground that there is a free speech right to advocate and to engage in a boycott that is politically motivated and expressing a political idea. Uh, and um, there have been lawsuits that have been brought by the ACLU and others challenging the state laws that have been enacted. We have so far split decisions. Uh, the lower courts have divided and they have divided over whether this should be considered political advocacy or whether it is sheer economic pressure and coercion because coming out of labor law, secondary boycotts to exert economic power may in fact uh, be regulated. But I think on the, on the basic idea that you have, this is not only exercising your own individual freedom of speech. Let me just interrupt myself and say, you know, I, I oppose the PDS movement. I think that's, you know, the way I oppose the Nazis, that I'm defending freedom of speech for ideas that, that I disagree with. And I should also say that if we're talking about academic boycotts that you know, a, a scholar from Israel or Saudi Arabia or anywhere is not going to be allowed to come to this country. I think that deeply violates First Amendment principles. But the right for people to amplify their individual voices 
by coming together with other people and using various strategies, including political boycotts, has been protected by the Supreme Court, rightly, going back to a historic case in 1959 involving the NAACP, uh, in which the NAACP was a very controversial and unpopular organization where it was trying to do its work countering uh, entrenched segregation. Uh, and, and, and the Supreme Court rightly said that you know, individuals, especially if you're advocating on popular causes, your freedom of speech is not very meaningful to make it meaningful and effective. You have to have the right to band together with others who share your viewpoint to amplify your voice. And then a, a couple of decades later, in another case involving the NAACP, uh, which was boyco organizing boycotts of white merchants who discriminated in employment and, and in service. Uh, again, the Supreme Court uh, upheld their right to do it as part of the First Amendment free speech rights of advocacy, association, and uh, seeking reform. What about in the workplace? Let's say a um, uh, Muslim gentleman is working there and his coworkers are saying derogatory things, inflammatory style against Muslims. Does he have the right to go to personnel and does personnel, should they tell them, cool it? So first of all, you know, if it's a private sector workplace, there are no First Amendment rights. Uh, however, there are statutory rights that are relevant, including the famous Title VII of the historic 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, which the ACLU very much supported. And that prohibits discrimination in the workplace, assuming that it's of a certain size, you know, mom and pop shops are, uh, are exempted. That um, discrimination on the basis of a number of grounds, including race and national origin and religion. Now the question becomes, is it discriminatory on the basis of religion to allow somebody to be subjected to, uh, I can't remember the exact details, but to cer certain derogatory uh, expression in the workplace by a coworker? Well, you might say, well, what about the coworker? Does the coworker have a right to free speech? If it's a private sector workplace, you don't have a right to free speech. And even if it were a government workplace, um, the free speech would be subject to one of those limits that I mentioned that go beyond mere dislike of the idea if it constitutes what is called hostile environment harassment. And that the Supreme Court has defined as, and it can, con hostile environment harassment can consist of expression, but it has to be sufficient efficiently severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive as to deprive you of an equal opportunity uh, on the job and for that matter in, in education. So those are the legal considerations, the human rights considerations that you would have to consider and then um, it's very fact specific as to whether the particular, how the particular situation should be handled. Boy, you're really putting me through my paces here. Great <laughs> questions. <laughs> Another form of censorship that we haven't discussed here is censoring a speaker by suing them for defamation, yeah. for libel or slander. Yeah, yeah. Donald Trump has said several times he wished the libel laws were different so he could sue his critics. And recently, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has spoken out saying that he's, he would like the Supreme Court to revisit the New York Times v. Sullivan decision. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, thank you. It's such an important development. So New York Times versus Sullivan in 1964, along with most landmark free speech decisions in this country, uh, came from the cauldron of the civil rights movement. No coincidence, because as I said earlier, every suppressive tool that could be marshaled to try to silence the pro-civil rights message was, and one of those tools was the standard tort common law of defamation, which basically said any uh, statement that is false and that harms the reputation 
of the individual about whom the statement is made makes you culpable for this tort of defamation. Uh, and you can be subject to enormous damages, including punitive damages. The New York Times case involved a paid uh, advertisement that had been taken in the New York Times by a group of civil rights activists. They were ministers, not Dr. King himself, but others who were active who were complaining about some of the local officials in Alabama. And, and, and they, so it was a long recitation of abuses and violations that had been committed. And out of you know paragraph after paragraph, there were like four details that were wrong, and they were so trivial. You know, like they said there was a demonstration, and the demonstrators were singing "America the Beautiful." Oh, they weren't. They were singing "My Country Tis of Thee." I mean, and yet, not surprisingly, the Alabama state courts not only held that this was defamation, as it indeed was under traditional defamation principles, but imposed such enormous damages that would have been incapacitating even for the New York Times, which at that time was very successful, that it would have had a huge deterrent effect on covering, uh, giving information about the civil rights movement, which was incredibly essential in order to advance uh, the civil rights legislation that was pending in Congress and, and so forth to, to help strengthen the movement. So the Supreme Court, as it often did in those days, understood this mutually reinforcing relationship between the struggle for equal rights and the struggle for robust protection of speech, even if the speech might be false, even if it might injure somebody's reputation. And there was very strong language. I'm sorry I can't remember the exact words because they're so eloquent. Uh, but talking about how free speech is often caustic and hurtful and harmful in the short run, but in the long run, we really need it. We have to give, we have to overprotect even lies, even defamatory lies, because that does less harm than making people self-censor for fear that they're going to be subject to these huge damages. That means we're not going to have the kind of robust journalism and fearless journalism that we need to cover these controversial subjects. And we know Mr. Trump has a, such a huge track record of bringing defamation actions and you know, could really have a censorious impact, as could, as could anybody else. I'm speaking as a you know, nonpartisan person here. Um, and so it is, I think that the Sullivan decision was a, a landmark for free speech, but for the whole human rights agenda. I think it's absolutely essential for um, the vibrancy of our democracy, nothing less than that, where we the people are the governors, and the Supreme Court actually said that in the opinion, that you know we have the right to criticize, even wrongly criticize, those that we elect who are supposed to be accountable to us and not the other way around. They should not be able to punish us when we misspeak about them or unfairly criticize them. Um, speaking of harm, mm -hmm. we certainly know that um, hate speech has caused physical harm and it's caused deep psychological harm. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen hate speech that has led to um, implicit biases, that mm -hmm. has led to overt discrimination, that has led to microaggressions. Mm -hmm. And yet often those victims of the hate speech do not have voices, do not have platforms for counter speech. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me if we're going to say that we are going to um, resist censorship, mm -hmm. then it seems to me we also have to say that we are willing to accept and tolerate the physical harm that it causes, mm -hmm. but the deep psychological mm -hmm. harm that it causes to multitudes mm -hmm. of communities, mm -hmm. and particularly communities that are poor. Mm -hmm. And I respectfully disagree with that, Barbara, and I, I tried to address that in my opening remarks, but let me go back to that. The harm, I believe, is not necessarily going to follow. And I'm speaking not as a psychological expert myself, but I quote many in my book who say, it is not inevitable. We can learn techniques not to be harmed, either psychologically or emotionally, and 
physiologically. You're, you're looking skeptical, but I will give you uh, citations. In fact, I don't even think this is controversial among psychologists. I've seen debates about what are the most effective strategies for building resilience, for um, mitigating these potential harms, but I think they all accept that it is not inevitable. I fully agree with you that in terms of access to counter speech, this go in part goes back to that question about social media, it is much truer now that a much higher percentage of us do have access to a literally worldwide platform to engage in counter speech, which did not used to be true in the age of mass media, but it's also true, and I do discuss this in my book, uh, that we do have the infamous digital divide, where it is disproportionately poor people and therefore uh, communities of color and others who have been traditionally excluded who have not as much access either to the educational or the technological resources that are absolutely essential uh, for developing the ability to counter speak on your own. I also believe very, very strongly uh, that it should not fall upon, and I'm very grateful that in the recent past it has not fallen upon only those who are disparaged to be the ones to respond to hate speech. There has just been the most enormous outpouring of criticism and condemnation for every one of these incidents. And interestingly enough, I went back and read the path-breaking law review articles that were written, and the first articles that were calling for hate speech codes on college campuses were written by law professors, interestingly enough, and they marshaled uh, data that I think was very powerful and persuasive, and it's what compelled the ACLU, rightly in my view, to revisit our traditional policy where they marshaled evidence about the psychological adverse impacts, the emotional, the physiological, and a very important one that you didn't say expressly, but I went, well, you, s you did, that there's also an adverse free speech impact potentially, right, if the people that are targeted feel silenced as a result, and that's a big damage to free speech. Um, and their articles, this was so interesting to me, every single one of them said, and this is a point I had forgotten all these decades later, that the problem is not so much the initial hate speech itself, but the silence of the surrounding community. As in my, I'm old enough, but it seems fairly recent, in the early 90s, they were complaining that the media did not cover hate crimes. This was before we adopted hate crimes laws, by the way. The media did not cover hate speech incidents. University presidents did not condemn hate speech incidents on their campus, nor did uh, student groups. And they said that, that that makes the harm even worse, or see an even worse harm, to feel that you're completely isolated and not supported in your community. So not to at all trivialize the serious problems that we still have, which I'm the first one to acknowledge and to work against, but there has been a wonderful sea change in that regard. Uh, university presidents, student body presidents, the surrounding community are all making clear that the, the person that is condemned and subject to contempt and disparagement is the person who engages in hate speech, not the, uh, not the person that is attempted to be targeted. Hi, I would Hi. just like to ask, um, what do you think social media and social media users can do to fight against hate speech without using censorship or punishment? So there are, uh, there are actually people who go online specifically to find hate mongers and to engage in, in communications with them. Oh, and, and one of the people who did it I'm, uh, is a famous musician, right? Uh, and he's g he gets in conversations. He's done a TED talk about this. So sorry, I'm blanking out on his name now. Um, he's African American, and he singles out members of the Ku Klux Klan and engages in conversation with them. And but then also in real space gets together and has dinner with them. And he says that he's recruited away a couple hundred. I, 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 you know, I haven't explored that in depth, but I have followed a couple of these cases, and I have to say, uh, they're very, very moving. Some books have been written about it. There are a lot of TED Talks, a lot of interviews that you can find. Uh, one example is a book that was written by a Pulitzer Prize winner named Eli Saslow. 
Um, there's a guy named Christian Picciolini who had been the head of a hate mongers organization, very violent, and he was redeemed, they sometimes use that word, by people who are reaching out. You won't be surprised with compassion and empathy, not at all compassion or empathy toward their ideas, but toward them as people and understanding you know, these human beings are complicated. In a lot of these situations, the people did not uh, come to these movements for ideological reasons per se. They had psychological, social problems, family dysfunction, so they were ripe for the recruitment to an organization that was providing some kind of family uh, feeling for them, and so they can respond to those who are providing a more positive alternative. Picciolini founded an organization called Life After Hate, uh, and as the it's based in Chicago, as the name suggests that he and other formers, there are enough of them, they call themselves formers, are dedicating their lives to recruiting other people out of these movements and doing their best to prevent people from, from going into it. Uh, one of the epigrams I have in my book is from Nelson Mandela, um, and it's a quote that Obama tweeted after Charlottesville, and I, at the time, it was the most repeated tweet in all of history, even exceeding those of our president, uh, and our current president, and um, the Mandela statement was, nobody is born hating somebody else because of the color of his skin or her beliefs and so forth. If we can learn to hate, we can be taught to love. And for the example, so you'll find plenty of resources. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a forum with Nadine Strassen, the former president of the American Civil Liberties Union and author of Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. Today's forum is the David Ralph Hertz Memorial Forum on Civil Liberties, made possible by a generous grant from members of the Hertz family, David N. Myers and the Charles Stuart Mott Foundation. We're delighted to have David Hertz with us here today. We appreciate your continued support of City Club programming. Today's forum is also part of our Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We are grateful to all of the residents of Cuyahoga County for their support through this public grant. Our community partners for today's forum include the ACLU of Ohio and the Northeast Ohio chapter of the American Constitution Society. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We thank all of you for your partnership. We welcome guests at tables hosted by friends of Dave Nash and students from Mayfield High School and MC Squared STEM High School. Support for student participation in City Club forums comes from KeyBank and the William M. Weiss Foundation with additional support from the donors you'll find listed in today's program. We thank all of you for being here today. The sale of Ms. Strassen's book, Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship, is provided by A Cultural Exchange. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Ms. Strassen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.
Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.